I do believe it's time for another year-specific rankings. Let's do 1987. <laughs> Welcome to my ranking of films which came out in the year 1987 and I am both pleased and horrified to reveal that I have seen 28 films from this particular year that is a record for this series so far I'm actually tempted to split this one into two videos I'm I'm undecided I guess you watching this will know if I've done that or not I had a sneaky look ahead to 1988 because I was curious to see if the numbers would go up even more for that one it hasn't the numbers have actually decreased a little bit for 1988 which i'm a little bit happy about now just a quick reminder that the top film today will go through to the grand final of a hundred films which i will be conducting in the future when all these years are completed and the film which comes second today may also get into that final as well but for now, let's get into it. We've got a lot of films to plough through. So let's begin with the film that I consider to be the worst film that came out in 87 by some margin. Not just the worst film which came out in 87, but also one of the worst films ever made, period. It's just an awful, awful piece of work. It's actually insulting that this film was released like this. If I was going to do a full review of Jaws the Revenge, I would give it half an axe out of five just for Michael Caine. Take Caine out of the equation. It's a straight zero out of five. The story's all over the place. All the other actors apart from Caine are atrocious. They are so badly cast. And to my shame, actually, I have this on my shelf. The reason being is because last summer I'd not seen any Jaws films for a long time. So I ordered all four on Blu-ray. I'd forgotten how bad the fourth one was. I haven't thrown it away. It's still on my shelf. I kind of think that if my kids grow up and they want to watch some of the earlier Jaws films, they can then see for themselves what the fourth film is like. They can take a look at this dark mark in cinema history and actually I could use it as a punishment for them you know if they're really naughty make them sit down and watch Jaws the Revenge and if they've been extra naughty I can make them watch Jaws the Revenge twice back to back. I was never really into Robin Williams my wife was she particularly liked Patch Adams my dad liked Robin Williams. In fact, when Good Morning Vietnam came on the TV in the 90s, he could not get that VCR set up fast enough. I watched the film with him out of curiosity, but it didn't really do anything for me. I didn't even find the stand-up sections particularly funny. To be honest, the only time I've really enjoyed Robin Williams was in Insomnia, and I suspect I would have enjoyed One Hour Photo if I'd have ever bothered to watch it. So basically his darker stuff, but his comedy side was never really my thing, and so Good Morning Vietnam scores low today. This is one I haven't seen since I was a kid, and I actually have no memory of it apart from Stallone going against a load of big tough guys who just seem to get bigger and tougher with every round of this tournament that he goes through but I can't remember anything else hardly I guess it's kind of like another version of Rocky except it's arm wrestling instead of boxing so I've no reason to ever go back to it if I'm in the mood for this kind of movie with Stallone in it I would rather watch a Rocky film so not much else to say with this one This is a war film, although to my shame I can't actually remember which war it's set in and I only saw it about a year ago or a couple of years ago but I didn't think it was that great in all honesty. I bought it on DVD and I think I chucked it in the bin after I'd watched it. It just wasn't amazing. The first hour was okay, there's plenty of actors in it who you sort of recognise from other things but the final battle is probably the biggest issue I had with it. It's just really small in scale. It takes place on this hill as you would expect with a name like Hamburger Hill, but all the gunfire is never more than about 10 yards away from the camera. It's just really 
small scale. I, I just expect more from a film like this. And so, I mean, I went through a phase of watching nine or ten new war films that I'd never seen before this one particular summer. And this was one of the worst out of those newer films. So here we have the comedy version of Star Wars, I guess. I have occasionally sat down to watch this throughout my life and I really enjoy the first 15 to 20 minutes, the big long spaceship that goes on forever and Rick Moranis taking his helmet off. I can't breathe in this thing. Brilliant. But I have the same problem with this film that I do with a lot of comedies that I occasionally watch, which is just the fact that I get bored after 20 minutes. This is not one of my favourite genres. And past a certain point, I just want to turn it off and watch a proper Star Wars film or watch some other film. I don't think we'll see any comedy films in the grand final. One of my all-time favourites is Caddyshack, and that didn't even make the final. That says it all. So now we're at 23, and I just feel like we've gone up a tier in terms of the quality, because No Way Out is not a bad movie, actually. It's a thriller about a naval officer, I think. I've not seen it since I was 10 or 11, but I remember it quite vividly. Kevin Costner plays the lead role. He's trying to make sure that he doesn't go to prison for Sean Young's murder. And the thing I remember about it the most is that there's this computer that's slowly revealing what's on this particular photograph. And Kevin Costner's worried that if he doesn't get the actual guy who's responsible for the murder before this photograph gets revealed, then he'll be the one who goes to prison. It's not a bad film. There's some good tension throughout it. But Costner has done a whole lot better. But it's all right. It's all right. Superman 4, on the face of it, is a really terrible fourth film in the same vein as Jaws The Revenge. But this one, at least, falls into the so bad it's good type of category. Whereas Jaws The Revenge is so far off the charts bad that you can't even watch it as that. I love the Nuclear Man concept. He's such a funny villain and he's played by a really inexperienced actor. I think he's got one expression on his face this whole film. And he's got these fingernails, these really long, almost feminine fingernails, which fire out bolts of electricity. It's just silly, really. But it's fun to watch Gene Hackman going up against Christopher Reeve one more time. Gene Hackman or should I say Lex Luthor, has got this really weird cousin character in this film who talks in a, in a weird voice. It's kind of like, oh, I see what you mean. Oh, and like, what the frig? But for some reason, I don't think I will ever dislike Superman 4. I go back to it sort of every five or six years, and I swear every time I've sat down to watch this film, I've always finished it, which has got to count for something. This is a pretty good one. I watched this and its sequel, Another Stakeout, quite close together at some point during the 90s, which kind of makes it difficult for me to judge these films because I can't remember which bits were in which film. I think I enjoyed the first one more. The first one's grittier, I think, whereas the second one went a little bit more comedic. I think they introduced a female character in the second film who was just annoying. I can't remember who played her, but certainly I, I've no, no real interest in ever going back to these stakeout films. I think it would make a good TV show, you know, have a kind of buddy cop thing going on where they constantly have to do new stakeouts every week. I don't know if they have such a thing as stakeout experts in the police force, but I think there could be something there in that idea. I actually watched a season of NCIS recently just for a bit of nostalgia and one of the best episodes in that little run that I went of on that show was the one episode where they were doing a stakeout. It was a lot of fun. So if there is a film with a stakeout in it or a TV show with a stakeout in it, I, I do tend to enjoy it. I have a little bit of nostalgia for this old Emilio Estevez film. This, in my opinion, is the weakest of the Beverly Hills Cop films. Those rumours of a potential fourth film just won't go away. I suspect in my heart of hearts it will not get made. But then again, I would have possibly said the same thing about Coming to America 2. 
But the second Beverly Hills Cop film always did feel like a very quickly thrown together thing for me. I don't think it was different enough from, from the first film to be justified, really. The third film felt a lot fresher, like, more like it was doing something different. Now, I will say that it's been so long since I saw any Axel Foley film that if I was to watch Beverly Hills Cop 2 tonight, having not seen any of them for donkey's years, I would probably really enjoy it. But if I watched the original film first and then came to Beverly Hills Cop 2, I, I would probably not have any interest in it, having just watched the far superior first one. This is a good one. I've only seen it the one time back in the 90s, but I would quite like to watch this at least once more at some point, I think. It's got a great cast and Archer, I think, is in it. Glenn Close, Michael Douglas. Douglas was very good at playing these kind of roles, you know, the normal suburban guy who can't quite understand why his world is falling apart around him. Similar to Disclosure and The Game. I, I always remember the Only Fools and Horses episode where Del Boy goes into the kitchen and he sees this boiling pan and you sort of think, oh, there's going to be a dead rabbit in there. And it turns out that it was it's granddad's pants. He's been boiling them. Del Boy's like, oh, no. If you're not from the UK, you have a clue what I'm on about with that. So here we have another one of those dastardly comedy films, except this one is actually pretty good. I saw this and its sequel, Three Men and a Little Lady, quite a few times when I was a lot younger. They always seemed to be on TV. And I might actually prefer the second film, funnily enough. I mean, the plots in both cases were paper thin and the laughs weren't exactly free flowing. But what kept you watching both of these films were the, the chemistry between the lead three actors. It was very good. You had Tom Selleck, Steve Guttenberg and Ted Danson, all highly skilled actors, not a single weak link among them. And I vaguely remember the woman being quite good as well, but I can't even remember who played her. I would wager that she did not go on to have an amazing career after this series was over, but I, I, I don't know for sure. But yeah, these films are okay. This was a really cool film. I watched it four or five times when I was a teenager. Again, a great pool of acting talent. Dennis Quaid, Meg Ryan. This was probably Meg Ryan's best film. I remember her hair looked amazing in this. Martin Short is considerably less annoying here than he was in The Three Amigos. But it's just a great story, a really unique idea for a film, and there's a lot of tension in it. I mean, I was always afraid for the Dennis Quaid character going inside the body because all sorts of freaky stuff can happen inside there, as demonstrated by what happens to that bad guy who sort of gets digested. That was really freaky. And then you were also worried for Martin Short, you know, I mean little mini spaceships flying around your body. God knows what damage that's going to do to you. So I was always on the edge of my seat watching this. There were quite a few different bad guys and they were quite intimidating from what I can remember. And then you had that weird ending where the bad guy known as the cowboy just randomly turns up in a limousine and steals Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid away. And then Martin Short has to go off and be the hero. And that's the end. Uh, it's, it's a weird film, but really enjoyable. And I always seem to remember that when this film was done, I always went off to the kitchen to make a drink and I had a real spring in my step, like I was ready to go off to a disco or something. I want to watch this film again right now. I've not seen it in 25 years. I was a massive He-Man fan in the mid 80s. I mean, it was my thing. I... I had He-Man action figures, I used to buy He-Man comics, I would always tune into the He-Man cartoons that were on TV. So when I found out that they were bringing out a movie, I was really excited. And sadly, I didn't get to go and see it at the cinema. My parents just didn't have the time to take me around about the time that it was on. I guess that was something of a childhood disappointment for me. When I saw it on the TV uh, six months or a year or so later, I didn't initially like it. It was just too different from the comics and the figures. You know, I mean, they had some of the bad guys in there like Skeletor and Evil Lynn and 
Beastman, but then they had all these other bad guys who they just made up for the movie. And I remember thinking, why? There's like this incredible back catalogue of villains you could have delved into. And I was particularly disappointed that they didn't use Trapdoor. Trapjaw, I think it's been that long. He was my absolute favourite villain, my favourite figure that I owned. I was gutted when he wasn't in the movie. So initially I didn't have a great relationship with this film, but over the years I've occasionally watched it and, and I've started to enjoy it more and more. And I think the last time I watched it, five or six years ago, probably less than that actually, I, I, I enjoyed it the most I've ever enjoyed it. It's like a really bad slice of the 1980s, but fun in a similar way that Superman 4 is fun if you watch it in the right way. So yeah, I kind of like masters of the universe now even though it's not really a good film I, I guess you have to be of a certain age to like this and i am is this the first horror film we've had today at any rate i'm not going to talk too much about prom night 2 here because i've already done a full review for this on my channel and i even talked about this film a second time when i did my prom night rankings video all I'll quickly say here is that this is a pretty good sequel, albeit it has nothing to do with the storyline from the first one. And it desperately needs a remaster because I don't remember this film being in a very good ratio and it had tons of scratches and stuff. So hopefully at some point we'll get a really good Blu-ray Blu release for this. So here we have another war film and one which is considerably better than Hamburger Hill. It's sort of a two-parter. So in the first half, we see all these new army recruits as they go under the watchful gaze of a really strict drill sergeant, which leads to this really unfortunate tragedy. I won't reveal what happens just in case you haven't seen it. Second half is more of a traditional war film, I guess, where all these recruits get to go into battle. I can't exactly remember which war it is, possibly Vietnam. It has been a long time since I saw the movie. I think I was about 18 or 19. Um, I think it finishes with all the recruits trying to get into this building so they can stop a sniper. I think I'm thinking of the right one, but this is a pretty good film. I've seen better war films, but I've also seen a hell of a lot worse. Some people think that this is the best of the Evil Dead films. I don't have that opinion. I think the first one is the best. I think it's the only masterpiece Evil Dead film, although the remake came very close. I do enjoy Evil Dead 2, but there are some things about it which just bring it down a little bit for me. The continuity in the first sort of 10, 15 minutes is really bad. I mean, I'm just left confused as to whether it's meant to be a sequel or a remake. And then once we get into the movie, some characters come into it from afar and that didn't really work that well for me. There's still a lot to love, you know, Bruce Campbell fighting his own hand and stuff. And then the big battle against that monstrous thing that fills the whole cabin towards the end. I, I do enjoy this film a lot. I just think there are two far superior films in the original and the remake. And I'm keeping a very close eye on that video game they're making, which I believe is coming out next year. I haven't completely decided if I'm going to buy it, but I'm certainly curious to see what they do with that. And I'm also looking forward to the next film. They're making a fifth film. I think it's called Evil Dead Rise. Supposedly it's going to have more of an urban setting. That could be really cool. I like all the Death Wish films, even though I've not seen any of them in at least a few years. I vaguely remember this one, the fourth one, being a little bit fresher than, say, two and three, because it's no longer Charles Bronson just responding to one of his relatives getting raped and then off he goes. I think this one tried to do something different. There's some kind of drug dealer who recruits Charles Bronson, or should I say Paul Kersey, into going and killing this other drug dealer or something. Uh, I, I just remember it being a little bit different, albeit once the action starts, it, it does start to feel then like a traditional Death Wish film. I'm not going to say whether I think this is better than the films before it because it's been too long since I've seen any of them. I'm getting very close to re-watching these films. It's been on my mind for some time now. I'm going to do it. I really am. 
Wow, it really turns out that I like more comedy films than I realised, although actually I probably liked this more as a drama than a comedy film when I was growing up. And I saw it about three times as a child slash teenager, I'm sure I did. It was something of a family favourite, you know, if it was on TV there wouldn't just be me watching it, there'd be quite a few people sat on the sofa. I think what I really loved about it was just the coming together of these two characters from completely different walks of life and then fate just keeps them together throughout the story a bit like Clint Eastwood and Eli Wallace in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and I loved the ending as well the fact that John Candy's character ends up living with Steve Martin now in my head as a kid that ending meant that uh, John Candy would be renting a room in that house for the rest of their lives and that was a really happy ending for me now that I'm an adult, I kind of look back on the ending and think, well, he probably would have stayed for maybe a couple of months just until he got back on his feet. And then he would have rented an apartment across town and sure, he might have met back up with Steve Martin for the occasional beer, maybe a barbecue from time to time. But that would be about it. I guess that's still a happy ending. The fact that they would be friends forever, but a little bit different to what I pictured as a kid. But I sure did used to really enjoy this film. I'm getting a little bit of a smile going just remembering the state of their car after it gets hit on the freeway. Doesn't it turn into a complete ramshackle skeleton of a car and John Candy's sort of huddled in it trying to get some sleep at some point? It, it's a really cool film, this. So into the top ten we go with my personal favourite of the Nightmare on Elm Street films. And it's still only come 10th, which I guess just about proves that I'm not really a Freddy guy. Although this particular one is absolutely awesome. There is so much creativity in this from the, the boiler room wall, which encloses it on the characters at one point. Uh, the giant worm thing, which almost swallows Nancy Hall, or is it Kristen? And then there's that kind of nightmare house, which I think it's Kristen again is is wandering around in at the at the start. And that's before we even get into any of the kills. If I could only watch one more Nightmare on Elm Street film for the rest of my life, it would absolutely be Dream Warriors with the Dream Master, the fourth film, close by in second place. This is a very special Bond film for me because it was the first one that I ever saw in the cinema. I was only seven years old. It was my gran who took me. It was one of those really old fashioned little cinemas in a place called Rugeley in Staffordshire where I did a lot of my growing up. I don't think that cinema is even there anymore, but I almost get teary when I think about that memory. It's such a special memory for me. In terms of the quality of the movie, it's it's really good. I've always liked Timothy Dalton's Bond films, both of them. I wouldn't put them anywhere near the top of my Bond ranking, but I certainly wouldn't put either of them near the bottom either. They're both really solid, well-made thrillers. And the fact that The Living Daylights has only come ninth today just gives you a little hint, I think, of the quality that we still have to come as we get closer and closer to number one. This is a kind of horror western hybrid. It was directed by Catherine Bigelow. All the films I've seen her do have been absolutely excellent. So she also did The Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty. I'd say Blue Steel is the only film of hers that I'm not massive on, but that was one of her earlier efforts. But getting back to Near Dark, this is a really fun time. You've got a trio of villains played by Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton and Jeanette Goldstein. And when you've got a pool of talent that good in your villains roles, you're almost guaranteed good results. And that is the case here. This is if you've not seen this one, absolutely make it a priority. Yep. At number seven, it's another vampire film. I honestly couldn't split this and Near Dark. From a very early stage, I knew that these two were going to go side by side on, on this particular ranking. From the minute that The Lost Boy starts, I always get a shiver on my arm. It's just that music that plays when you see the credits come on. It's such a unique film, this. They've tried to do sequels from time to time, but I've heard that they're all pretty awful. Even Corey Feldman came back at one point. It didn't work, supposedly. But the original Lost Boys, I mean, you've got Kiefer Sutherland as this really badass vampire. And that scene where 
they're inaugurating the good guy into their clan it's it's really good and he's, he's sort of hanging off that railway or something and he has to drop into the mist it's it's such a good scene and the finale as well when the vampires storm the house that's that's there's some really cool stuff in there i always remember the vampire who falls in the bath for some reason then there's that twist with the the middle-aged guy suddenly turns out he's the head vampire or he was all along and he's, he says something like i still want you i haven't changed my mind about that and then they sort of impale him on something like it's silent night deadly night I, 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 it's been a while since i saw this though i have seen it like three or four times overall such a wonderful movie I've got a personal story to tell when it comes to Lethal Weapon 1 because when I was in my first year of high school, I moved areas and so I had to change high school, which is not ideal when you're halfway through your first year. But the night before I was due to start at this new school, I was really nervous. I put the TV on and, and the first Lethal Weapon film was on and I'd never seen any of them before. There were only three out at the time. The fourth one hadn't yet come out. So I watched this movie and it made me feel so much better about the fact that I had this really nervous day coming up the following day. And I've been a fan of the series ever since. I don't like this idea that they might come back for a fifth one. As far as I know, that's still an ongoing thing, although I believe that Richard Donner was going to direct it, even though he's like 90 or he was 90 before he died. Now that he's passed away, I, I, I wonder whether they'll just quietly let the idea go now or whether they'll press on with some other director, somebody else running the show. Personally, I'm not bothered. I, I just feel like the whole Lethal Weapon thing, that they just left it too long if they were going to do a fifth film, in my opinion. I mean, I would go and see it if they, if they made one, just out of curiosity, but I think they should just let a good thing be, in my opinion. As far as I'm concerned, this is comfortably Steven Spielberg's best film. If you don't know, it's about a boy who lives in Singapore, I think it is. He's an English boy, but he lives abroad with his, with his parents. But he gets separated from them just at the start of this invasion from a foreign country. I think it might be Japan. And for the rest of World War II, he's got to sort of bounce from place to place, just surviving as as best as he can until he can somehow find his parents which he does at the end it's a happy ending but it's so emotional this film made me cry when I was a kid I have occasionally watched it since I've got a copy of it on DVD I think it's such a good film and for the longest time I would have told you that it's one of my favorite films ever and yet I've come to do this ranking and it's only come fifth for the year that that it came out that's revelatory to me I can't believe that but there are just four films ahead of it today that I prefer to Empire of the Sun but it is an absolutely magnificent film this stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus just like me like most people I love Predator it's not quite made the grand final today but competition at the higher end in 1987 is just so tough. I think Predator might well have finished in the top two if it had been in a lot of the other rankings in this series. When I was growing up, we had about 100 films on our shelf or more, me and my dad. Uh, most of them were taped off the TV. If we had 100, I'd say like 97 of them were probably taped off the TV and like three of them were like official VHS copies because we didn't normally spend £10 on a film we just wait wait for it to come on TV and get it for free if you see what I mean but Predator was one of those very rare films we actually had a proper VHS copy of and so every time I watched it it would feel really smooth and slick there'd be the trailers on the front and it would play perfect whereas all the other films that we had most of them anyway were taped off the TV there was crackling at the start adverts and then you'd probably get adverts like halfway through the film and stuff that we may or may not have been able to get rid of so yeah I, I, there's not much to say or not much to add I should say about the actual movie for this one everybody knows Predator everybody knows it's a wonderful film and it's number four today so here we've got another Arnold Schwarzenegger film Funnily enough, when I did my Arnie rankings last year, I'm pretty sure that Predator came above The Running Man, but it just goes to show that 
when two films are quite similar in quality, they can change places if you redo a rankings at some point, and that's what's happened here. I think the reason I've done this is because The Running Man it is a great action film, but it makes me laugh so much. I mean, this is probably the funniest film ever that isn't officially a comedy. It's so, so funny. I had this friend at school who was also a fan of this film, and we would just fire off quotes at each other from the movie, and we were, we were like proper little fanboys of this film. We even went home uh, from school at lunchtime once just to watch The Running Man. I've heard that they might remake it. I, I, I hope that they don't. I just don't think they could ever capture what this film was and what it did. It's such a great film. And at, at the end, when um, Damien, Damon, uh, when he flies into that billboard and Restless Heart kicks in, it's such an adrenaline rush. So our first qualifier for the grand final today is a John Carpenter film. He is going to be very heavily represented in the grand final. I think this is his fourth film that has now qualified. He's also got Halloween, The Fog and The Thing into the, the grand final. I think this might be the last film for him because when I think of anything else he's done past this point, I don't see any of those movies getting into the top two for any given year. But even so, four films in the grand final that's quite amazing i just love john carpenter and this film is great it's so underrated i saw it when it came on tv very late at night when i was a teenager and it blew me away the soundtrack is absolutely awesome donald pleasance is in the movie it's mostly a singular location film i'm not entirely sure what building it is that the characters in this film are in it's kind of like a modern day church but it doesn't look like a church for the most part but it's really good and it's got a great ending, a typical Carpenter ending, which is just really clever and thought provoking. Can you fly, Bobby? So Robocop is my number one today. It's a magnificent film. It's funny. It's instantly quotable. It's a great action film. It's gory. It's got all this stuff to say about large companies. It's a great story, it's emotional, it's got a great soundtrack, a great villain, it's got lots of great villains, it's just frigging awesome. I've seen it like a dozen times throughout my life, at least. I've not seen the remake, which I think came out in 2014. I've never had any interest in watching anybody try and remake this film. I'm just perfectly happy with, with the original film as it was. And I tell you what, if you can come top of a rankings like this, where there have been all sorts of great films from six downwards or six upwards, depending on which way you look at it, then you are truly a great film. And I think the original Robocop will do very, very well in the grand final. So for now, I'm going to wrap things up. There is one more question left to ask. There always is. If you're a horror fan, you might have noticed that Hellraiser is missing from this list. I have never seen any Hellraiser film. Now, ever since I saw The Exorcist last year, Hellraiser has probably now replaced it as the most famous horror film I have never seen. For some reason, I've just never really fancied watching it enough to actually go and do it. I don't even know what it's supposed to be. Some kind of bold bloke with pins in his head who's from hell or something. He has some kind of magic box or whatever. I just don't know what the frig the film is about. At some point, I'll try it and probably think it's great. I, I don't know. I've just never been able to pull the trigger on it. So it's one of those anomalies in my horror watching life that has just never been remedied. Apart from Hellraiser, I can't think of anything else from 87 that... I would like to see. I did have a look through, you know, the film lists that are on Wikipedia. I didn't spot anything. But in all honesty, this ranking today has been so large, 28 films, that there was never going to be much left over that I've not seen that, that I want to particularly. So Hellraiser is, is something I'm going to have to try at some point. I, I think as well, the fact that it's such a long series, like 10 or 11 films, of I just think to myself, oh, do I really want to get into that? I'm not sure, because most people um, who have seen those movies say that there's only like a couple of good ones and then it gets really bad for, for the rest of the series. And do I want to 
leave myself open to being swept along by all that badness. I, I don't know. But anyway, that's for another day. For now, I'm going to call time on this 1987 rankings. Robocop and Prince of Darkness are going through to the final. I'll be back soon to do 1988. Until next time, cheerio.